so excited to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Uh, many of you have seen him before. The first time I actually got to meet him was at the weekend two years ago. And I've gotten to see a lot more of him since then, since he was the guest speaker back at the weekend, or back when we called it Reboot, Reboot 2018. So the reason I got to see a lot more of him is because at that event, very much like this, he ended up meeting his wife. So you never know, guys. You could be meeting your future spouse here at the weekend. But with that, you guys know this man. He was a leader here at Spectrum for a while. He's been here a lot. You've seen him around. Can we please give a warm, warm, super excited weekend welcome to Mr. Peter Unger. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm so excited that you're here. And um, this is an event that was canceled a couple times. So this shouldn't have happened. Tonight shouldn't have happened. Tomorrow shouldn't have happened. And I don't know if you've been planning on this the, the entire year or if you were just one of those people that signed up like two days ago. Um, but regardless, just know that there's a group of leaders that plan this event so that you could be here and it was so important to them that this happened. And I promise you, there's a reason you're here this weekend. And it could be, it could be life-changing. It really could be. And I, and I know that sounds crazy, that something in your life could change in 24 hours. But just believe me, it, it could. Who here is here for the first time? You've never been to maybe Spectrum or you've never been to the weekend. Wow. Yeah, put your hands up. Yeah, can we welcome everyone who's never been here? Wow, that's so awesome. Okay, who's been here one year, two years, three years. Just raise your hand if you've been to the weekend, you've been to Reboot, any of that. Wow. So awesome. So you guys, you guys know what this event does every single year. Well, as we kind of get started, um, I just, I just want to say that, you know, tonight, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter necessarily where you're at with, with community. If you've been around a lot of people or this is like overwhelming this year because we've all been isolated or even where you're at when it comes to faith. All of us are in different places with the idea and the reality of God. And if, if this is new to you, I just want you to know, even if you don't believe yet, those of us in the room that do, we have enough belief for you. We have enough faith for you for this weekend, don't we, guys? We have enough for you. And so I, I just want you to be able to work through the reality and the idea of God. And if it's something that you don't yet believe in yet, I just want you to know that God believes in you. And so as we get started tonight, I just want to take a moment to pray for us, and then we're going to dive in. Heavenly Father, I uh, thank you so much for every single student that's here tonight, every leader, every person in the room. I thank you for what you want to do over the next 24 hours in all of our lives and, and inside of us. And, and I just pray that regardless of where some of us are or aren't at with you, whether we feel so distant from you, and we don't even know if you're real. Or, and for the people who feel so close to you and are so excited to just grow in their understanding of you and grow in their understanding of themselves, regardless of where we're at, I just, I ask that you would wrap us up in your love, that you would make the proof of your existence so real in every single one of our lives that every single person in the room right now would be able to end this weekend and say that God is real, that God loves me, that I'm important to him, that my life matters, that my life has purpose, and that even in the midst of such a crazy year where none of us know where we're going, I pray that every single person in this room would walk away feeling that they have a future and a hope, feeling that tomorrow is worth living for, that there's a reason that they're here. Help us understand the reality of who you made us to be, God, and what you want to do in each one of our lives this week and make the reality of your love and your presence and your existence undeniable. I pray that you would just violate our, our view of reality, that you, would, that you would just change the way that we see the world, that you would change the way that we think, that you would change the way that we feel, and that you would just heal every one of us because each of us is going through something that requires some sort of healing in our life, whether we care to admit it or not. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, we're going to jump right in because we don't have a lot of time together. 
I have spent the past four years of my life following Jesus and falling more and more in love with who he is. And I know that might sound weird to some people, um, especially if you've never been in that place before. But what I want to do with you this week and what I hope we can accomplish is I want to go on a journey together. And I want to look at some of the moments in the life of Jesus and the people that he encountered and, and the way that he treated them and the way that he, that, he, that he talked to them. And I hope it makes the scriptures become so alive and so real for you. I hope the idea of God is, is just made real and alive in a way that it never has before. Because the scriptures tell us that Jesus came to be the savior of the world, that he's the son of God. And if you look at the way that he went about that, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because the first thing that you would do maybe if you were God and you were coming to be, become a human being and to save the world and to save people is you'd probably be born into the right family. Maybe a family of royalty, maybe a family of wealth, so that you have an upper hand and that whatever message you're trying to share with people all around the world, you can get it out there quicker, right? You would probably want to spend time with people who were influential, people who had power. But this isn't the reality in the life of Jesus. You see, what the scriptures show us is that Jesus' life started in poverty, that he started his life 2,000 years ago in a family that had nothing, and that when it came time for him to start building relationships and building friendships and spending time with people, the people that he chose to interact with, the people that he chose to communicate with, were the poor and the marginalized and the forgotten and people that most would just see as invisible and not even acknowledge when they passed by on the street. This is the way that Jesus chose to interact with, with humanity. This is the way that he chose to come. And what's, what's crazy about that is that Jesus' life, it looks so human when you really look at it. But then there's a piece of it that is completely unexplainable because of the miracles that he performs, the people's lives that he heals. He changes the way that people think. He changes the way that people live by healing them of sicknesses and diseases and, and things that have made them outcasts in society. And, and this is the way that Jesus' message grows. And so we see both such a human life but it's so clear that he's also just as much human as he is God because Jesus is doing the miraculous and, and, and he performs these amazing miracles. And it's, it's something that shows us that Jesus is both, he's uniquely spiritual, but he's profoundly human. And so many times it's easy for us to, to look at the scriptures and to look at the Bible and what we see is we see a life um, and we, uh, of Jesus and we think, oh, well, he's God. That's why he was able to do that. What we don't understand is that he was fully human as well because he came to show us how beautiful being human can be. And so even if you don't believe in God tonight, I know something about you. I know you believe in human beings because you're surrounded by them, because you are one, and you have a lot of life experience being a human. I'm pretty sure no one in here has ever been like a giraffe or a bottlenose dolphin. I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone kind of started the same way. You started as a baby, and now you're, you're just a bigger baby, right? And so every single one of us is a person. So what I want to do real quick, I want to take just 30 seconds, and whatever you're taking notes on tonight, whether that's a phone or you're grounded from your phone and you don't have it and you're taking notes like old-fashioned pen and paper, I want every single person in the room to do this with me real quick, and I just want you to write down in like bullet point fashion what it means to you to be human, I want you to write down a few words and describe what you think it means to be human. If someone was to ask you tomorrow to define what does it mean to be human, how would you describe being a human being? What are some words you would write down? So go ahead and take a moment, and whether it's in your phone or it's on paper, write something down. This is in school. It's not a test. There's no right or wrong answer. I just want you guys to take 30 seconds and write down what you believe it means to be human. Okay, 10 more seconds. There's no right or wrong answer. Just write down what you believe it means to be human. Okay, our time is up. So I just want to hear someone just start shouting them out. Shout down some of the words you guys wrote down. Say, say them a little bit louder. Faithful. Okay. Spiritually sound, sinful. What was that? 
tempted. Okay, a couple more, a couple more. What do you guys think it means to be human? Broken, lost, unholy. Okay, okay, awesome. So I think you guys heard some of the people around you. Do you notice something? No one said the same thing. Every one of us has a different definition, a different idea of what it means to be human. And here's what this means for you. This means that you all see the idea of being human differently, even though we are all human beings. And what's crazy about that is no one had the chance to communicate with each other, and so we all came up with different definitions. And the words that you wrote down, I hope you wrote them in pen, because if you wrote them in pencil, don't dare grab your eraser, because by the end of this weekend, I want you to be able to look back at these. Don't erase them, don't scratch them out, and I want you to see if that's still how you would define being human, because that's a conversation that we're going to have this weekend. What does it mean to be truly human? How does God see that, and how are we supposed to see that? Because everyone has a different reality of what you think it means to be a human being, and that means that we all have different expectations, but there's also some things that we all can agree on. You guys used words like sinful and broken. I heard unholy. I heard faithful. I heard follower of Jesus. I heard so many different phrases and so many different words, so thank you guys for sharing those, but what's so interesting is that even if we all had different definitions, if I was to ask you if there's something inside of you that has an idea that to be human is to do good because you know when you see wrong that's not how we're supposed to do things. Every single person would say yes. There seems to be something inside of us that, that is saying, I want to be fully alive. And no one has to teach you this because it's already in you. Isn't it strange that you can feel that you want a life maybe better than the one you're living and you want to be a better person even if you've never been that person before? Where does that desire come from? And why is it that when you look at social media and when you read through history books and when you interact with people in your everyday life and at school, that you have an idea of what it means to be a good person and you have an idea of what it means to be a bad person. Because we can look at animals and watch National Geographic all day and you'll never see a lion chasing a gazelle and then eating it and saying, oh, that's so an animal, that's so an animal. But you'll look at a human being and if you hear that someone murdered someone or attacked someone or purposefully hit them with their car, or any act of violence, anything at all, you would say, that's inhumane. So we have an idea of what it means to be humane and what it means to be inhumane, and we would never hold anything else. No other species would be held accountable to that standard. It, it seems like if we look at history books and we hear about some of the most beautiful things that have happened in the world, but also the most devastating, we can identify that there are people that both were creating a better world and people that were destroying the one that we were living in. And you can look at the people who are destroying something and say, that's not how you're supposed to be human. That's not right. And you can see people who were inspiring, who shifted our country or who shifted a part of the world or even, who even changed the world like Jesus. And you can say, that's someone who's creating the future. That's someone who's doing something that's good. You can look at someone mistreating someone and you can say, hate's not the answer. Love is what brings us together. And even if we never all talk about this, we can all agree on that. And the, and the reason that this is going on inside of us is because this is the original intention for humanity, to be good. And Jesus stepped into human history so that we could get a glimpse at the beauty of being human by looking at the life of someone who did it perfectly. Jesus came to restore our humanity. Jesus came to make us human and to give us a future. Because the best of humanity is lived out in Jesus' life. And when God originally made us, he said that it was good. And so tonight, I want to talk to you about an aspect of us that God wants to restore. He wants to give us clearer eyes. And so that's the title of tonight, Clear Eyes. 2020, what a year it has been. I remember before this year started, we were... We saw all these cliches on social media, and we were all journaling about how 2020 was like the year of perfect vision. 2020 was going to be the year of like perfect sight because you look at the numbers and you say, wow, 2020. Yeah, that's, that's like perfect vision. Like if you have 2020 vision, you can see things clearly. And I don't know about you, but the more that this year has gone on, I don't really feel like I can see much at all. I mean, we endured a global pandemic together. We have gone through this war, it seems like of people becoming aware of racial injustice, and we're seeing division in and outside of the church of people taking different sides and different stands on all these issues. We're in the midst of a new election coming up. The political, social, economical climate that you are in right now is like nothing history has ever seen before. And yet, 
underneath all the COVID death stats is a statistic that's even more important, and that's suicide. That's how many people have taken their life this year because they feel alone, because they feel isolated, because they're lacking community and they're lacking hope. And that's what 2020 has really done is it's made us feel more and more blind as it's gone on. And it's been a year where it's like, I don't know what's next. All I know is it's going to be crazy or it's going to be, it's going to be devastating. And it's interesting that a year that was supposed to give us so much clarity, was supposed to give us so much vision, is a year that we don't really know where we're going. And we all kind of feel lost in the mix of it. I remember when I was 10 and I went for my first eye exam. If you've ever been to an eye exam, um, you know how terrible it can be when they put you on this machine where they blow a puff of air in your eye. And every single time, I've been doing this for 13 years now, I've gone every year, and I like my eyes twitch and they water, and, and the person that goes back there with me is always so frustrated because it takes like 10 minutes to get me through this. So if you ever want to like torture me, all you have to do is lock me up in a room and have someone like blow air in my eyes <laughs> over and over again, and I'm, and I'm done for. But once we got past that part, got back to see the doctor. And he showed me all these different letters on the other side of the wall, and I remember just looking at them, and I'm like, why does he think I'm going to be able to read these? I didn't think I had anything wrong with my eyes, but I could only read the top letter. And then he puts this machine in front of you, right? You guys know what this is like if you've been to the eye doctor. It's not the nightmare that the dentist's office is. And then, he, and then they change the, the, the mechanisms, and you see different optics, and all of a sudden things get clearer. And it felt like a superpower. I was like, I can read all the letters. E, A, B, Z, R, A, da, 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 you know? And you just go down the list. And I walked out that day because uh, with glasses and with contacts, a glasses prescription, and I was wearing my contacts, and I remember stepping outside, and I'll never forget it. It was the middle of fall, kind of around this time of year, and I looked up, and I could see the leaves clearly, and I could see the clouds in the sky really, really well. And I had never known before that my eyesight was bad until I could see clearer. And it was this moment where, like, my perspective shifted because I didn't know that there was a better way to see until I was told that I had bad eyesight. I think it's easy to dismiss a problem you don't think is your problem. Most of us dismiss blindness because we know that we can see. But what if I told you that you're seeing with a fraction of the sight that God intended you to see? And not just your literal eyes. I'm not saying that everyone here needs to go get glasses tomorrow. I'm saying that there's a lens and a way which you can see the world if God gives you the clear eyes and the new eyes that you need. And this new sight allows you to, to, to move from seeing in black and white, from seeing the world bleakly, from only seeing what's wrong with the world, to seeing the world in color, to seeing the vibrancy and the beauty and the wonder of the world and, and the people around us. It moves you from being nearsighted, where you can only see what's right in front of you and you feel like there's no future and it's just, it's distant and it's foggy and it's unclear, or maybe you're farsighted and you can only see what's ahead and you're just waiting for the next thing. That's what will make me happy. The next relationship, next year of school when I'm finally in high school or when I'm finally in college or when I finally get a job. But you can't see what's in front of you and you're not happy with what's in front of you. And so you're missing the presence of being with the people who are right in front of you. Whether you're nearsighted or farsighted or you're seeing in black and white, the reality is, is that every single one of us wants 20-20 vision. Every single one of us wants to see life clearly and to see... To, to see the beauty of the world in the way that we were designed to. And this is the craziest thing about glasses and contacts. I've been wearing them for 13 years, and the more I wear my contacts, the worse my eyes get. So the thing that's supposed to be helping me see is actually, in the end, making me more blind. And one day I'll have to get LASIK surgery to fix my eyes. And this is the difference between the way that Jesus wants to help us see, is that the more you walk with Jesus, the more you do life with God, the clearer you see people, the clearer you see yourself and the clearer that you see God. And so tonight, I want to look at a story in John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It says, Afterwards, as Jesus walked down the street, he noticed a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused this guy's blindness? His own or the sin of his parents? Jesus answered, Neither. It happened to him so that you could watch him experience God's miracle. While I am with you, it is daytime and we must do the work of God who sent me while the light shines. For there is coming a dark night when no one will be able to work. As long as I am with you, my life is the light that pierces the, world darks, the world's darkness. Then Jesus spat on the ground and made some clay with his saliva. And then he anointed the blind man's eyes with the clay. He said to the blind man, now go and wash the clay from your eyes in the ritual pool of Siloam. So he went and washed his eyes and his face. And he came back and he could see for the first time in his life. So Jesus notices this man that no one else sees. And the first thing his disciples, his followers ask him is, 
Whose sin caused this man's blindness? His own or the sin of his parents? And the reason they asked this question is because in their culture, they believed in something called prenatal sin, where you could actually make mistakes and you could sin in the womb. Talk about an unfair life. And so you can make these mistakes before you're even born, and then once you are, you have to deal with the penalty of those sins. And that's why they believed some people were born disabled. Some people were born with different illnesses. They think that it was either your sin that caused that or it was the sin of your parents. And so you were living in a present reality that was a product of the past mistakes of either you or someone else. What a, what a tragic view of the world and what a tragic view of God. You see, they, they looked at his suffering and they determined that his past decisions had to be responsible for his present reality. And so to see with clear eyes is not to assume that you know why someone is feeling the pain that they're feeling right now. It's to believe that I can't see the story and what's really going on inside of them. I don't know what their past looks like. All I know right now is that they need healing. And so they walk up to this man and, and they want to make a spectacle of him and, and learn from Jesus in that moment. And so they're talking about him, but they're not talking to him. How humiliating. Growing up, I uh, would drive past homeless people all the time. I still do. And I would maybe be in the passenger or the back seat as a kid. And I'd be with a parent, a family member. And there were several times in my life where either a family member or a friend pointed out to me, they're like, oh, you see that homeless guy over there? Yeah, the reason why he's homeless is probably because he's like done drugs and he's an alcoholic and he probably was like really irresponsible with his job. And I always used to think, how do you know that? And then one day, a few years ago, um, I, was, I had the privilege of, of getting lunch for a guy who was homeless and having a conversation with him. And I simply asked, what's your story? And what he said changed my life forever. He said, 10 years ago, I got in a car accident with my wife and my two kids. And my wife was killed, and my two kids were killed. And I, and I went into such a severe state of depression that I wasn't able to work anymore. And so I eventually lost my home, I lost my job, I had no money, and I ended up on the streets, and I've been homeless ever since. And when I heard that story, his story, and I saw him for what he was, which was a human being, that has a past that's not necessarily always responsible for, for their reality, I realized that sometimes bad things happen to good people, and that doesn't mean that they deserve that to happen to them. To have clear eyes is to see people more accurately. It's to see people in a way where we don't assume that we know why they're at where they're at. And then Jesus says, neither. I love that. Jesus never is just limited by two options, sin of the parent or his sin. Neither. It happened so that he could experience God's miracle. God's miracle is being changed from the inside out. You see, God's intention for your life is not for you to live with a life that is just slowly changed, but a life that is completely transformed. A life that doesn't look the same as before you knew God. The best of you is yet to come, but you need a miracle that only God can bring. And then Jesus says, while it is daytime and I am with you, we must do the work of him who sent me while the light shines, for there's coming a dark night when no one will be able to work. As long as I am with you, my life is the light that pierces the world's darkness. Jesus is saying, while I am here with you, it is always daytime. My life is the light that shatters the world's darkness. To move with God is to illuminate the space that you're in. To move with God means that you can light up a room that feels incredibly dark, a, a room where people don't have hope, a room where people are sad, a, a room where people are just struggling through life, and you can actually illuminate that space because you're the only one there that has hope. And then Jesus does something really odd. He, it says he spits on the ground, and he makes some clay with his saliva, and then he anoints the blind man's eyes with the clay, which is just a fancy way of saying he made clay, and then he put it on the guy's eyes. And you got to remember that this man was blind, but he wasn't deaf. He can hear that Jesus is coming with his disciples. He, he can hear the rumors of God that people are talking about. Here comes a man who can heal people. Here comes the Messiah. Here comes someone who can help blind eyes see for the first time and lame people to walk. And the first thing that Jesus does when he gets to him is he spits on the ground in front of him. This was something he was so used to, the humiliation of, of people spitting in disgust, spitting because they walked by him and, and, and they thought, just like the disciples did, that he had sinned and that's why he was the way that he was. So here's Jesus doing something that seems so humiliating. 
And in, in that moment, imagine being this man and, and thinking just another day where I'm on the side of the road and I'm begging and someone is spitting. And, and I don't know about you if you've ever spit to make mud, because I haven't. But I think it takes a lot of spit. I think it takes a lot of spit to make mud. So I, I don't think this was like some like, like girly spit. I think this was like some man spit, like, like some big, like, like, I think this was like a lot of spit, okay? And I've heard different like theologians and different people who study the Bible their whole life, and they say that, oh, well, it was divine spittle. Like, that's like the fancy word for when you want spit to not be gross, even though it still is. Divine spittle. Jesus' spit was, was, was the spit of God, and that's why this man was healed. It's like, I think this was just regular spit. I think this was just really gross, nasty spit. And I know that if you spit, and it's not in your mouth anymore, you probably don't want to put it back in your mouth. Like, you're spitting right now. Just, just accept that. Just swallow. Just, like, feel the spit in your mouth. It's always there. It's kind of gross. It's even more gross when it's not inside of you anymore and it's on the ground or when it's on someone else's eyes. So I don't think I'd want spit on my eyes, but this is what Jesus does is he spits on, on, on the ground and he makes this mud and then this moment that seems like an act of humiliation, you can hear it if you really place yourself in this story. The people are laughing. They're making fun of this man. He's absolutely humiliated. He can hear everything going on around him and he doesn't know what to do. And Jesus hasn't even talked to him yet. And then... Jesus says something. He says, now go and wash the clay from your eyes in the ritual pool of Siloam. This was the first time that Jesus had spoke to him. No promise of healing, just a command to go and wash. And this place that he sent him to go to, Siloam, that word means sent. Jesus tells this man to go to a place called sent. Jesus is saying, you cannot stay where you are to experience the healing of God. You must move. You must move to experience the healing of God. You see, healing is a journey. You must move to be healed. And sometimes in our lives, we identify something that's broken inside of us, and we expect God to heal it. But can I just pose an idea? If it took you this long, if it took you five, 10, maybe 15 years to get this broken, is it really right to expect God to heal you in one moment. Sometimes healing is a process. Healing is a journey. And sometimes God heals you right where you're at, but sometimes he needs your participation. He needs us to get involved with the story he's trying to create in our lives so that we can experience a healing only God can create. To move with God is to be healed. You have to move. And think about this. He had to find this pool on his own. See, to, to go where Jesus sends you is, is, is to move on a journey of healing. It's a journey of faith. It's one that begins in darkness, but it will end in seeing light. And, and, and I'm convinced, and there's no proof behind this, but I'm convinced that every step he took towards the pool of Siloam, every single step he took, his eyes were being restored more and more, and he was able to see clearer and clearer. He just didn't know it because this clay was caked on his eyes. And it wasn't until he washed his eyes off that he realized that he could see. I don't think he was healed right there at that pool. I think he was healed from the moment that Jesus touched his eyes and told him to go. And with every step, he was healed more and more. And, and then we're told that he went and washed and he came back and he could see for the first time ever. Oftentimes we only see the life behind us and we see the life right in front of us, the one that we're in the middle of. And we can't even imagine the future because we're just trying to survive. We're just trying to get through today and get to tomorrow. And I meet a lot of people that, that really feel like the only thing that some yesterday brought was regret. And all I know is my number one goal is for things not to get worse. So I don't want to bring more regret into tomorrow. And I think what's so beautiful is that when you look at the life of, of someone like this blind man, every day looked the exact same. Because when you're living in darkness, everything looks the same. You could be in a room that's full of people. You could be in a room that's full of beauty. And, and you could be in a room in a space like this. But if the lights are turned off or if you're blind and you can't see it, then you don't know the space that you're in. And so everything looks the same. And so this man's life was changed in a moment. He could see for the first time ever. Not, and it's not because of his new sight 
but because of what sight makes new, that, that his life becomes so beautiful. Because as soon as he opened his eyes and he could see, he began to see how beautiful and how amazing and how wonderful and how extraordinary the world is. For the first time ever, his eyes were opened and he could see the world that he was living in. In that moment, he was given a future because he actually could see where he was going. And, and, and it's crazy because as we go on, verse 8 says, this caused quite a stir among the people of the neighborhood, but they noticed that the blind beggar was now seeing. So they began to say to one another, isn't this the blind guy who once sat and begged? And some said, no, it can't be him. And others said, but it looks just like him. It has to be him. All the while, the man kept insisting, I am the man who was blind. And I think this is the reality of transformation, is that Jesus will change your life so much that the people around you won't even believe that it's you. See, they could only see him for who he was in the past. They could only see him for who he used to be. They couldn't see him for who he was in that moment. And that's why they missed the miracle. The only reason they were skeptical is because they couldn't believe that he could see. And, and, and I want to know something. I want to know if when you look at people and you see something change in their life, are you shocked by it? Are you shocked by people around you becoming better? Are you shocked when you become better? Because if you are, it means that you're looking at people the same way his neighbors and friends looked at him. You're looking at people and you're, you're shocked by the change because you only imagined a world where they stayed the same that they'd always been. You, you, you saw them in their worst self and what we don't realize is that when we only see someone for the worst of who they are or when we don't see a future for someone and we can't believe that their life could get better or that they could be a more incredible human being, what we do is we actually tie anchors to their soul and we hold them back from becoming the person that God created them to be. And, and, and so you, you have to ask yourself this question of how do I see people? Because clear eyes are eyes that don't see people for who they used to be and hold them accountable for just that past. Clear eyes are eyes that can see people for who they could be. And it's to see the best in people. It's to believe a future that doesn't yet exist could be a reality in their lives. That's what clear eyes do. And then they ask him this question. They say, what has happened to you? He replied, I met a man named Jesus and he rubbed clay on my eyes and he said, go and wash from the pool of Siloam. So I went and while I was washing my eyes, I began to see for the very first time ever. So the people of the neighborhood inquired, where is this man? I have no idea, the man replied. They asked him, what has happened to you? And this is the question that I want to be asked every single day of my life. What has happened to you? You see, your life could actually be the best conversation starter about Jesus your life could be the best conversation starter about how amazing God is because your life looks so different from the people around you. And so then they decided to take him to the Pharisees, which are religious leaders um, that kind of oversee the people. And they were upset because he was healed on the Sabbath. And this was just a day that you weren't supposed to work. You weren't supposed to do anything. And so Jesus had violated that. And the first thing that they ask him is, what happened to you? And he says, I met a man named Jesus and he healed me. They say, who do you believe Jesus is? And he says, he's a, he's a prophet. And they didn't believe him, so they ask his parents to come in to validate this. And they ask the parents, and the parents say, yes, he's our son, and yes, he was born blind, but we don't know what happened to him. Just ask him. He's an adult. And the reason why they, they point the finger back on him is because they were so afraid of being rejected by their community. You see, they were part of a community where if they claimed, yes, he was healed, this is amazing, they would actually be kicked out because they believed that, that Jesus had done a miracle on the Sabbath and this violated everything that they believed. And so they were so afraid that they didn't do what's right. You see, to have clear eyes is to do what's right even when you're afraid. It's to have courage to stand in front of people who intimidate you and to still say the truth. This was their actual son and they didn't even say the truth about him. They just said, yeah, he's, he's been blind since birth. Um, we don't know what happened to him. You, you go talk to him. They weren't even amazed by the miracle enough to be courageous enough to tell the religious leaders what was going on. And we have to be careful that we're not as blind as these religious leaders who could not believe that he had been healed because they had never experienced that kind of transformation in their life. And so they were skeptical that, that someone's life could be changed instantly. And then finally, they bring him back in, and they, and they say, promise to tell us the truth. Do you think Jesus is a sinful man? And he says something amazing. He says, 
I don't know what kind of man he is. All I know is that I was blind and now I can see for the first time in my life. And so they ridicule him and they end up kicking him out. And it's nothing new for him because he's, he's used to being an outcast. And then verse 35 says, when Jesus learned that they, throw, they, they had thrown him out, he went to find him and he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? The man whose eyes were healed answered, who is he, master? Tell me so that I can place all of my faith in him. He had never seen Jesus before, but earlier that day, he had heard Jesus' voice. So the moment that Jesus walked up to him, he knew who he was. How could you ever forget the voice of the person who changed everything for you? He trusted Jesus with all of his faith because Jesus had healed him. And so he says, who is this son of God? Tell me so I can place all of my faith in him. He just trusts Jesus so much because this is the man who healed him and changed his life. This is the man who gave him a future for the first time ever. You see, seeing Jesus didn't change his life. It's experiencing Jesus' healing earlier that day that changed his life. And this is what it means when the scriptures tell us that we live by faith, not by sight. That he was able to believe in Jesus, not because he saw Jesus, but because of what Jesus did in his life, and it, and it created this faith. And then Jesus replies to him and says, you're looking right at him. He's speaking to you right now. It's me in front of you. And then the man threw himself at Jesus' feet and worshiped him and said, Lord, I believe in you. And Jesus said, I've come to judge those who think that they see and to make them blind. And for those who are blind, I've come to make them see. Some of the Pharisees were standing nearby and heard these words. They interpreted Jesus. They interrupted Jesus and said, you mean to tell us that we're blind? Jesus told them, if you would acknowledge your blindness, then your sin would be removed. But now that you claim to see, your sin remains with you. So Jesus tells this man, you're looking right at him. The son of God is me. And, and, and right there in that moment, he says, I believe. I believe in you. And, and, and what's so amazing about this is that earlier when he was around those neighbors, he had replied to them when they asked, who is Jesus? And, they, and he said, he's a man who healed me. And then to the religious leaders, he says, he's a prophet of God. And then to Jesus, he finally admits you're the son of God. And so as that day went on, and he could see clearer, and he could understand more who Jesus was, he came to a clearer conception of who Jesus was, from being just a person who, he, who healed him to being the Son of God. And it changed everything in his life. And, and, and the, so the paradox of this story is that the blind man is the only one who can see, and everyone else is blind. Because the disciples looked at him and they wondered what had caused him to be blind and, and what in his past had led him to that place. And so they completely misunderstood who he was because they judged him based off of what they thought his past was. The neighbors were blind because when they looked at this man, they didn't even believe it was him because they couldn't imagine a world where he could be better than the person they used to know. They couldn't imagine a world where he could see. The Pharisees were blind because when they looked at this man, they were so skeptical of the healing that had taken place because they had never even experienced that kind of healing in their life. His parents were blind because of fear. Fear kept them from seeing him clearly. Fear kept them from telling the truth, from, from defending their son, and, and, and it made them blind in the end. I don't want you to live your life believing that you can see clearly if sight has blinded you, because if you assume the worst about someone, if you assume that their present pain is because of their past mistakes, you're blind. If you look at someone and you can only see them for who they used to be, you're blind. If you, if you look at someone and you're skeptical that their life has been changed because you've never experienced that kind of life change, or if you look at someone and fear keeps you from standing up for them, you are blind clear eyes, the eyes God intended for us to see, the, the eyes Jesus came to restore inside of us are eyes that see people for who they are, that see people as amazing and as wonderful as God sees them, sees God and understands that God is good and understands that he made us to be good, that that was the original intention of our design and that whether while, while we've lost that over time, that, that Jesus came to actually restore that inside of, of each of us. You were created out of love so that you could see the world through the lens of love. We were created so that 
we could look at everything around us, the people around us, and we could see them the way that Jesus sees them. We could see with, with new eyes and clear eyes. And so clear eyes don't mean, doesn't mean that your vision gets better and you can take your glasses off like Spider-Man. What, what, what clear eyes are, we're talking about our hearts, we're talking about our souls, we're talking about what we do end up seeing through our eyes because of what God changes inside of us. And the reality is, is that to have clear eyes is to have a future and to have a hope for the first time ever. And so I want you to know that God wants to give you new eyes. He wants you to see clearly. He wants you to have an accurate idea of who you are and, and to see the beauty and the wonder in the people around you. He wants you to have clear eyes so that you can understand and know who God is better. God wants us to have clear eyes. Jesus came to restore our humanity and to make us human again. And the eyes that we have, the eyes that we're born with, and the way that we see people, it's just, it's just not good enough. We are capable of so much more. I hope you know that your life has such a high intention for it, that God has such incredible dreams for you. But you can't make those dreams a reality with your eyes closed. You have to open them. And having clear eyes, having clear eyes is, is a gift that only Jesus can give. So he came to give us clear eyes so that we can see the future that he has for us. I want you to see in color. I want you to see with the vibrancy of a million colors because you look around and you see beauty and you see wonder and you see the best of people. You can look at someone, you can see a future that doesn't yet exist for them and you can say, that's who you were created to be. And then you can speak that into their life until you actually see them become that person. We are so much like this man, this blind man who needed healing. He needed to go to a place called sin. And along the way, Jesus healed him so that he could see. And in the end, he saw so much clearer than anyone else around him. And you know what? I'm convinced that his life was different after that encounter with Jesus. I think what this man's life looked like is I think it looked like a life where you walk around and you see people that no one else sees. I think he saw a lot of blind people and I think he spit a lot and I think he made a lot of clay and I think he wiped it on a lot of people's eyes. And then I think he led them to this pool, this place called Sen. And along the way, I think he had a conversation with them about who had healed him and who had changed his life. And I think with every step of his faith, their faith grew. And they got to the pool and they wiped their eyes and they could see for the first time. And so they weren't only healed, but they also came to know the healer. And this is what happens when your life is forever changed, is that you can't help but feel this responsibility, this obligation to help other people see the world the way you see the world, to see it bigger, to see it better, to see it vibrantly. And, and you won't be able to stand the idea of anyone you love or care about not being able to have clear eyes because Jesus has changed the way that you see. And when God changes the way that you see, he changes the way that you live. And when he changes the way that you live, he changes the way that you love. And when he changes the way that you love, the world around you starts to look a lot different, a lot better, a lot more like the world that God has in mind, all because you were willing to go to the place called sin. You were willing to experience the healing that only God can create. And so tonight, I know this. I know that a lot of us, we need clear eyes. I know that we need to see things the way that they are. We, we are the best of what God has created in this world. Human beings were created in God's likeness and in His image. And I want you to know that this life is not possible unless you have Jesus. It's only with Jesus. This is the catch is that we can't have clear eyes. We can't have our eyes restored. We can't have new vision or new sight. So I want you to know that some of you, maybe tonight you need to cross the line of faith and you need to give Jesus your life because you need to have clear eyes that can see and only God can guide you through that process of healing. I know some of us, we need to be healed. We have something we're going through that's hurting us right now. And maybe you feel blind in a way. Maybe you feel like you can't see anything in front of you, that you're living in complete darkness and it makes you feel hopeless. And it makes you feel like tomorrow can't be better than today. And it makes you feel like you have no future. And so even as we're having this conversation tonight, the idea of having a future better than the reality you're living in right now isn't even something you can comprehend. You don't have the strength for that. And, and, and if that's you tonight, I want you to know 
that following Jesus is a commitment and a decision that can change everything in your life. And it's, it's, the one, it's the decision that some of us need to make so that we can have clear eyes and we can finally see the way we were created to see. Will you guys bow your heads with me for just a moment? Close your eyes. If you're here tonight and you want to see clearly, if you're here tonight and you feel like you've just been living a fraction of the way that you're supposed to, that you don't see people the way that you want to see them, that you don't even see yourself the way you want to see yourself, that you look in the mirror and you you miss the beauty and the wonder of who God created you to be because you just can't imagine that you are a good person. If you feel like you're someone who needs clear eyes tonight, I want you to know that only Jesus can do that inside of you and that's what he wants to do. And if you wanna make that decision to follow him, it's so simple. I just want you to say a quick prayer with me. You can say it in your heart, you can whisper it. I just want you to say one simple phrase, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. It's not everything that you and God need to talk about, but it's the start. It's a start of a conversation that will change the way you live. It will change the way you love. It will change the way that you see the world around you. Jesus, I give you my life. And, it, and if, you, if you just said that prayer with everyone's eyes closed and heads down, I just want you to do something real quick. I just want you to take all the courage inside of you. I just want you to put your hand up real quick. I just, I just wanna know who maybe said that tonight? Who maybe said, Jesus, I give you my life? Just put your hand up. I see you. I see you. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else that just said that? Just said, Jesus, I give you my life. Hands all around the room. So amazing. You guys can put your hands down. I just want to pray for you real quick. Jesus, we thank you for every boy and every girl today who said that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life, who made that decision to cross the line of faith. And God, I ask that this weekend you would just wrap them up in your love, that you would just start to show them the eyes that you have for each of us and how clearly we can see and how beautiful it can be. God, I ask that you would open all of our eyes, that you would just create healing inside of us. Everyone tonight that, that prayed that prayer and for everyone who didn't, I ask that you would just bring us to a place called sin, that you would lead us and that you would heal us along the way so that we can become the healing that other people need in the world around us. Jesus, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Can we just thank God for all the people who responded to him tonight? Hey, we have a big conversation to have this weekend and we're gonna keep going tomorrow. We're gonna talk about what it means to have full hearts, what it means to have a new future. So do whatever it takes to get here tomorrow morning. Do whatever it takes to get here tomorrow night because you don't wanna miss what God wants to do inside of your life this weekend.